Now that the mics are up and operational, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here. We had a couple of technical glitches coming in today, most notably that the moderator of this panel didn't show up. So you're <laughs> stuck with me, and we're ready to go and to discuss missile defense, a subject which is so important to the United States these days with three of the top experts in the country on that subject. We're delighted to have with us Congressman Mike Waltz, who not only is a returnee here at CPAC, a frequent guest attendee and speaker previously, but now the congressman representing the 6th District of Florida, and we're really, really happy to have you here, Mike. Thanks so and much. Rebecca, we're happy to have you as well. Rebecca Heinrichs is a senior fellow with the Hudson Institute, a distinguished career in national security issues, and we're really happy to have you with us as well. And finally, down at the end, Dr. Thomas Carrico, am I pronouncing that right? Yep, that's it. Who uh, is both at Carnegie Mellon and is a um, long time expert on the technological side of <coughs> missile defense. So I'm going to give each of our panelists an opportunity to say hello, and then we're going to jump right into where we've come since the closing days of the Reagan administration, where I think a lot of folks knew more about quote unquote Star Wars and missile defense, and where we are today what's changed, what has remained the same, and what challenges lie ahead. So with that, Congressman, take it away. Well, thanks so much, and thrilled to be back. I think Rebecca and Tom probably forgotten more about missile defense than, than I know, but I do want to give you um, just a little bit of my perspective. One, you, you mentioned Reagan and, and SDI, uh, Star Wars, and just we were talking a lot about that this morning on on Fox uh, in terms of President Trump walking away from this deal with Kim Jong-un, you know, bringing up a lot of memories of uh, President Reagan walking away from Gorbachev over his demands to get rid of uh, and to walk away from space-based uh, missile defense. Thank God uh, Reagan made that choice, that very wise choice to walk away then, and thank God President Trump walked away from what I think could have been a, a very bad deal uh, in North Korea. So. From my perspective, and plugging back into this, I've spent the last couple of years in North Florida politics, but now on the armed service, on both the Armed Services Committee and the Strategic Force Projection, both Sea Power and Strategic Forces, uh, and also the Space Committee um, on Science, Space, and Technology. My head is in back into space uh, and where we're going. I, pardon the pun of my head with space, but. Uh, <laughs> A couple of things that have really stood out to me is how much, I don't even like calling them near-peer competitors uh, anymore. I'd call them peer competitors, particularly increasingly when it comes into missiles and now into the hypersonics. I can't get into it for classification reasons, but you know, we received a pretty detailed brief on uh, hypersonics that the Chinese and Russians are developing and have developed, and it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Uh, we. Um, have a long way to go. And uh, we truly need to invest in a meaningful way, Rebecca, we were talking before this about whether the budget numbers are going to reflect the investments we need in missile defense. Our adversaries, bottom line, our adversaries have been working hard on this. We have been somewhat asleep at the switch. That's not to criticize too much because we have these things called wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere they have made some real leaps and bounds, and we, we have some catching up to do. Um, hypersonics, for everyone who doesn't know, is basically allows these missiles to fly in between a traditional arc of an ICBM, and I'll let the experts over here get into the technical aspects of it, but they essentially fly between the seams. So they fly too fast for our traditional ground-based uh, interceptors to be able to hit them. They're flying speeds in excess of Mach 5, and then the trajectory that they go on is very difficult to track and below what a normal ICBM would fly over. Uh, so, you know, right now I'm really worried about that threat and something I'm going to be leaning on the Pentagon very hard in terms of their projections of when we can meet that threat. I'll, I'll just leave you with, with one other thing and then, and then hand over here to the experts. Um, one thing that I do want to give this credit or this uh, administration real credit for that I did not see in the past. I was with, in a previous career, with uh, Secretary Rumsfeld and then Gates and then Vice President Cheney in the Bush administration, was I want to give this president credit for really focusing on, and this Pentagon, left of launch. 
meaning how do we disrupt a missile and disrupt that command and control capability before it even launches? How do we get into their decision loop, whether it's political, whether it's informational, uh, whether it's cyber, uh, whether it's electronic warfare, but how do, we, how do we prevent ourselves from having to stop a missile mid-flight uh, and getting into the very, very difficult dynamics of hitting a bullet with a bullet in space? Uh, that's something I'm also very interested in, in making sure that not only the intelligence community of the Pentagon have the right authorities, uh, have the right funding, and, and truly have the right strategy to, to stop this threat before it even uh, gets off the ground. And then, you know, finally, and I said I'll shut up. No, please I, I want to give, uh, I, I also want to give credit to our friends, the Israelis, uh, and the administration for, for devoting half a billion dollars uh, through the recent MOU uh, to our friends in Israel, and also the Pentagon credit. I, I was in the Bush administration there when there was a lot of hand-wringing about whether we should fund and support the Israelis on, on uh, David Sling, on the Arrow 3, on the Iron Dome. We have seen those systems be fantastically successful, so successful that we're now going to buy them from them, uh, it, or at least portions of those systems. So I think those are positive developments, but I have to tell you the, the leaps and bounds our adversaries have made uh, is, something, is something that we really need to be concerned about and focused on. All right, now I'll shut up. No, that's great. Rebecca, I want to go to you sure. for a little bit of policy perspective and then to Tom for more of the technological perspective, although I know you are both the recognized experts and that your expertise crosses over a little bit. Sure. Well, um, thank you, Congressman. I think that that's a, a great start to kick off the conversation. I, I would just want to sort of zoom out a little bit. And what do we have? What kind of missile defense systems do we have currently in place? Because I think when I talk to a lot of just normal Americans, you know, and I say, what, what is... You know, what do you think we have? We, there's a North Korea is in the news a lot. The North Koreans are developing um, intercontinental ballistic missiles. So those are missiles that can reach the United States. Uh, before uh, President Trump sort of entered into this new phase of his approach towards North Korea, where we're really uh, having more negotiations and conversations with them, we were sort of at the height of what I call a fire and fury era of the uh, relationship between the United States and North Korea. And that was because Kim Jong-un was testing missiles okay, and at different ranges. One of them was this Hwasong-15 missile, which was just a monster. It was just a gigantic ICBM. And it made a lot of people really nervous. I mean, they tested it, and it, was, it, was, it went further than we thought that it could go. It went up into space and came back down. So really long range, and it was really big, which um, gives us... Uh, we, 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 they haven't proven the ability to do it, to, to, to put, obviously, a warhead on that and get the warhead on the rocket, you know, on the missile out of the extra atmosphere and back in and, and get it landed on the target that, it, that they want it to. Um, they, they haven't done that. But because it was, so, it was such a big missile that we think that they could probably fit something of the weight of a warhead on there um, and get it where they want it to go, um, or at least kind of getting to that, that point, although they haven't finally proven the, the, the reliability and the ability to do that. And um, so when I ask people, you know, what, what kind of missile defense system do you think we have in place to, to intercept something like that? And I sort of have get the range of, we've got something, we've, surely we have since, you know, Rogan, Ronald Reagan gave his SDI speech, we have a missile defense system in place. And then I've gotten some are like, we don't have anything, do we? Or the system we have doesn't work. And so just real quick on that, just to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a primer on, on, on how the systems work. We do have a Homeland Missile Defense System in place. President George uh, W. Bush got us out of the ABM Treaty um, after 9-11. Um, and, and that enabled the defense industrial community and the military to cooperate and get something fielded pretty quickly. And so we have these interceptors in Alaska and California that can protect the United States homeland, all 50 states, against the kinds of ICBM threats coming out of North Korea and Iran, but it was mainly deployed to looking at North Korea. Okay, um, so that's what it's designed to defend against. It is not designed to defend the homeland against Chinese and Russian missiles. So if somebody asks you, do we have the ability, if the Russians were to launch a missile, maybe even accidentally, or you know, one, you know, one, one, an unauthorized launch, is it, is it geared towards that? You'll get a different um, spectrum of responses of whether or not we can get sort of a one-off, two-off missile that's coming at the United States. But the, 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 the system that is in, the, in place today is not designed to handle an attack from either the Russians or the Chinese. <laughs> Okay, it's designed to handle North Korea and Iran, those kinds of threats. Rebecca, sorry, just, sure. uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, though. That system 
in testing only has about a 50% I'm so glad you asked, rate. Congressman. So, this so is when we're talking about, well, well, Susan Rice, you know, Obama's national security advisor, saying, well, we can just live with, because I hear this all the time, he won't launch a missile against us because he knows we'll destroy him. Well, I'm not willing to make a 50% bet when that missile's in the air that our, that so our system So that's a work. great question, and I'll answer that kind of in two ways. Sure. Um, the first way I would, uh, the first thing I would say is, um, the system that we currently have deployed, I would say, is better than 50%. It is not 100%, and it wouldn't be anything. I would never solely rely on missile defense to handle the current threats facing the United States for missiles. That's just that's, that's an unwise defense policy. It is better than 50%, though, and so we want to give the military credit for that because you hear a lot of people say that this system doesn't work, won't work, and therefore we shouldn't spend money on it. And to sort of push back on that myth, I would just say that the current interceptors that are in the ground today are better than the ones that we had fielded initially when we first deployed it. So when you look at the whole spectrum of tests for this current system, if you put them all together, the percentage is a lot lower. If you look at the interceptors in their current form, the current technology that are in the ground today, um, they have been successful in five out of the last six intercept tests. Okay, so it's a little bit better. You would still, you still though, have to continue to stay ahead of the threat. And so even though the North Koreans are not testing the missiles, which President Trump talks about a lot, and he's right to point out that is a good thing, it is a, sufficient, it is a significant thing, it's not a sufficient thing. Because what the North Koreans will do, and why Ambassador Rice is wrong about this, is that the, the North Koreans can still produce many more missiles and they can still work on the technologies even if they're not testing the reliability. And so if you keep the current system static with its current success rate in place and you're not evolving it, you're not investing in it, the North Koreans can still get out ahead of it and get past it. And of course, you never want to get to the point where you're saying, well, let's just bet on it and hope that we can ca yeah. you know, catch a missile. You don't, you don't ever want to do that. Um, but it's a great question, because I, and, and I think it speaks to, one, that the, the, the technology continues to evolve. As your own technology, you can see your phones are <coughs> constantly evolving and getting better and, and able to do cooler things. Our missile defense systems um, are, but, but, but the congressman and the House Armed Services Committee, which the congressman is on, that's the committee that's going to oversee a lot of the, the things that our missile defense systems are doing and trying to decide with the, their appropriator colleagues how to invest more money. And that, current, that system definitely could use some attention and some resource to make sure that it is the best system that we possibly can, especially if we're going to sort of buckle in and deal with diplomacy with the North Koreans for a long time. It might be a while before we get those missiles out of that country, mm -hmm. which means there is a star uh, role for missile defense to play, and we really have entered a new missile era for missile defense. I want to wrap it up to give Tom a chance to, to kind of um, contribute here, but I will just say um, we really have entered sort of a new missile era in which missiles are proliferating throughout the world, um, Iran, uh, the North Koreans. Anytime you see in the news the Iranians testing a, a space launch, a lot of what they can learn from those space launches can be directly applicable to a missile uh, technology. Um, and so don't, don't, you know, don't fall for that. I know this audience won't, but, but you, know, you, you don't want to fall for that thinking that's just an innocuous, harmless program. They just want to go to space. They're, they can apply that technology to their missile, their offensive missile program. Um, but then the other thing that I would just um, leave you with is we really do, even, um, <coughs> the, the, we have come a long way where there are many missile defense programs that have garnered more bipartisan consensus, sea-based missile defenses um, that, that handle sort of the medium range and longer range range missiles um, at, at sea, and we have them deployed in different regions, and then the short-range missile defense systems that handle the short range, you're, you're seeing that they've been successful. The Saudis have them, that they've been using them in the, in the, in the war with the, um, the Houthis, the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen, um, with some success. And so you're seeing missile defense prove itself out in no kidding, real time on the battlefield. <coughs> And, and then you have these home, home um, defense, missile defense systems, and they all play different roles, and they comp they're complementary and they work together. What, what I would just leave you with is that we really do have to continue to expand the system. We have to move out of this paradigm where we're only defending against the limited threats from North Korea and Iran. And even though we're out of the ABM treaty, that sort of, you know, the pre when we lived under that treaty, we, we lived under this idea that our offensive missiles were really going to hold um, each other accountable, the United States and the Russians. You know, we, we, and, and that missile defense um, would sort of upset that, that the mutually assured destruction paradigm. And our technology has improved, missiles have improved um, from our enemies, and so we have to adapt the system, move beyond, and continue to do what we can to make sure that we can provide some defense against some of these other 
the congressman mentioned hypersonic, some of these other missiles that the Russians and the Chinese have. Because missile defense does a couple of really cool things for us. One, if, if, we, if we integrate it into our plans, our military operational plans, um, offense, defense mix, is what you, what you do is it, 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 can prov it can play a role for deterrence. It can deter the, the adversary from even thinking that it can successfully launch an attack against the United States if we might, or against one of our assets deployed overseas, if they think that there's a good chance that the United States might be able to intercept it, and then the United States has an opportunity to respond and more options. So it has a role to play in deterrence. And then it also has a role to play that it, it will actually um, protect that which the United States values most. Why would we want to give these guys a free shot at the stuff that we value most that's deployed in our allies? And, and so we really need to continue to invest in these things um, uh, to, to help the United States um, uh, have a better opportunity in the in the event that deterrence fails and that conflict breaks out that we can um, limit the damage done to the United States and win in a conflict uh, and so that's that's kind of where we want to go we got to continue to improve on it continue to build build on the legacy that that President Reagan has left us terrific dr. Tom Carrico well, how, how did all this happen how did we get the technology that gave us the opportunity to even imagine much less accomplish as mm. congressman Walt said hitting a bullet with a bullet and what have been the technological advances? What are we looking at for the right. future? Well, I think I'll really pick up kind of where Rebecca left off. Uh, and I appreciate, Rebecca, that you, uh, you know, addressed in particular kind of the, uh, the testing uh, thing as well, because that is a bit of a misnomer. You know, for instance, if you go out there and you start your car, you crank your car, it doesn't start, you crank it again, it doesn't start, and then you take it into the shop and get it fixed, and then you crank it and it starts it, do you average the number of those cranks? Is that a meaningful number? Or is it actually, what is the reliability of the of your cranking of your car since you got it fixed. And so the 9 over 17 uh, test intercept for, for GMD, that's since the late 1990s. Uh, and a lot has changed. There have been several configuration uh, differences in terms of, as, as you said, what's actually in the ground today. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, important to recognize. But as, as Rebecca also said, that is very much about one thing. And that is the long-range ballistic missile threat for basically one guy, uh, North Korea. And that is what we as a country have been chasing for over 20 years. We've been chasing that threat from the Clinton administration on. How did this happen? What is the story, as you asked? And the story is, you know, we, we put these things, air defenses, into, into combat in Desert Storm, and it kind of captured our imagination. Uh, the idea of Patriot missiles going after Scott captured the imagination of Congress. That helped kind of fuel some interest in, in technology and the withdrawal from the ABM Treaty in, in 2002. I've seen it's not hard to capture our imagination. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. unfortunately, usually it takes some kind of catastrophe <laughs> yeah. to capture our imagination. We're good at chasing things better than we are to, to outpace them sometimes. But, you know, we also heard in the past uh, couple minutes here kind of all this, this up-and-coming threats, hypersonic glide vehicles, uh, cruise missiles, this kind of stuff. Uh, and we heard the president and other folks talk about kind of this new period uh, that we're entering into. And what is that? Uh, and it is a, uh, so much of the uh, anti-access area denial, the A2AD stuff that folks talk about is missile-based in one way or another. And I like to talk about a, kind of a, a renaissance in missile technology uh, that really spans a spectrum. It spans a spectrum across really all aspects of altitude, propulsion type, trajectory, range, and mission. There's just a whole lot of different kinds and categories of missiles out there uh, that can hold at risk U.S. assets. And we, we talked about the, the proliferation thing and, and these new uh, glide vehicles and things like this. Why are they doing this? What is the significance of all this? And therefore, what is the strategic significance of active missile defenses in encountering it? And the significance is that this is at the heart of America's place in the world. It's at the heart of American power projection in terms of our overall defense and foreign policy. This is about our relationships with allies so that they are not threatened and cajoled and coerced, right, and blackmailed and therefore bandwagoning with some of the other big guys in, in the world, uh, Russia and China in particular. And so let me just suggest that that, that, tw that really 20 year period that we have been chasing the North Korean ballistic missile threat and putting billions of dollars into it we may be reaching the point, irrespective of the kind of what's going on with these diplomatic talks, quite irrespective of that, we need to pivot to something different. And that is the first paragraph that is the central theme 
of this administration's national security strategy and national defense strategy is what? That our current period is defined by the need to focus on not, not North Korea and Iran and not terrorism, but in the first instance on major powers, Russia and China. Now, for nuclear defense and nuclear, our nuclear posture review, not much has changed, because guess what? Our nuclear deterrence has always been about the big guys, Russia and China. But with missile defense, it's different, because for 20-some years, we have been pushing apart active missile defense from our relationships, our deterrence and defense relationships with Russia and China. And so if we are serious, if this administration is serious about pursuing major power competition with respect to Russia and China, we're going to have to do something different on the missile defense front. We got all these radars pointing towards North Korea, but if the threat ain't about North Korea anymore, that means they're looking in the wrong direction. And that means we're going to have to go to different places, including especially uh, space sensors, to even see these things coming. And so while we've been, as a country, spending 20 years chasing the North Korean ICBM threat, Russia and China have been making uh, and keeping us busy on counterterrorism. They've been making the most of that time to pursue different kinds of air and missile threats in that spectrum I talked about. It's, it's, it's everything. It's not just hypersonic glide vehicles that kind of go between the gaps and seams of our defenses, as I was talked about. It's also advanced cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Those advanced cruise missiles can hit your carriers or your bases or your big radars from behind very quickly. It's also UAVs. And then it's the combination of all these things together at once. Mm -hmm. And how do you, you know, your ballistic missile defenses are only so good as they can defend themselves from a cruise missile. And so in the prospect of deterring and defending against major power competition, we have to reorient to that. That is a big change. The gravity of that change, I do not believe, has been appreciated. And the uh, muscle movements that you saw in the 2019 budget and that we are very likely to see in the 2020 budget are quite likely going to be inadequate to the task that has been laid down in, at kind of the policy level for the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. So a whole lot's gonna need to be done. Unfortunately, we are not doing the kind of robust pivots. And, and guess what, folks? That means we may have to take risk on North Korea in order to do the right thing in terms of going after uh, Russia and China. Again, this is not about some kind of one-off, somebody has a, a indigestion, they pop something off. That's not what this is about. This is especially about America's role in the world and power projection, the guarantees that we have made both to our, our allies and partners, but also to our adversaries, that this is what we intend to do, this is what's important to us, and that this is what we will put forces behind. But if that becomes less credible, then we're in a, we're in a bad situation. So that's kind of the stakes of all this, uh, and that's, that's how all this, uh, I think, fits together. And if I could just just completely agree with everything that Tom just said, and I just want to underscore one thing, too, because it is interesting. Why is it that this particular panel is here at CPAC, and why is it that missile defense, well, isn't that kind of a strange niche area in yeah, defense kind of policy? Yeah. But the reason, the reason why it is different, and the reason we talk about missile defense a little bit differently, the reason this girl from small town in Ohio has spent a lot of time thinking about this issue and working on it is because of what Tom just said, and he, and he said it in, in a couple different ways. Missile defense enables the United States to act in the world with less coercion, being coerced less. With less with, with, uh, we're taking away the coercive power of our, of our enemies, of our adversaries, and the blackmail ability that they have, because that's what missiles are, are, are that's what they do for you. And so when you have countries that they, they can sit back and they say, we're not gonna compete with everything that the United States is doing in their Air Force, in their Navy, um, we can't catch up, but you know what we can do? We can invest in our missile arsenals and make them do interesting, difficult things so that we can hold at risk that which the United States values most. Our, and they don't, it doesn't even have to be, it could be the U.S. homeland, it could be our Air, our Air Force, our, um, our yeah. Navy carriers, um, it could be our, 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 um, our allies, our space assets. So they're, they're looking at what, what is the United States most reliant on, most dependent on, and if we can have the ability to hold that at risk, we have coercive power over the United States. 
And so, and so that's why this area is unique and important. And if we're, if we're, we got to get it right, we, we don't really have a choice. And we have to make that switch now. And, and President Trump has signaled that he wants to, but we need to match it up with resources at this point. If I can just add on, and then I think we want to open it up to q and A. I, Tom, you raise a great point. I've spent a lot of time on the campaign trail and whenever we go on Fox, CNN, whatever. Why does this matter? Why does this matter to my uncle who's a Harley mechanic in North Florida and, you know, leaves the house, go to Walmart once a week, right? Um, it, it, I think we take a lot for granted in terms of our position in the world, and that is, to your point, yep. just reinforced, it is putting that at question. Um, the advances the Chinese have made in how they're positioning themselves, namely in the South China Sea, uh, and their ability to dominate Asia and therefore dominate trade and therefore put at risk our relationships that we've established with the Japanese, with the South Koreans, with others, is mainly <coughs> going to be done through missiles. Uh, it also is going to put at risk space. And one of the kind of the mantras that I've taken on taken on is making folks realize how dependent we are on s our space architecture now. From real-time banking to the stock exchange to over-the-horizon navigation, how things arrive in Walmart so cheaply uh, from, from around the world to how we got here today on, on GPS to how we communicate, it's all relying on space. Well, that architecture is incredibly fragile and it's not redundant. Mm -hmm. So if a piece or two of that is is taken out. It wasn't built to be defended. It was just kind of built to hopefully operate well. So I'm asking a lot of questions of the Air Force, of the Defense Department. I am fully supportive of the Space Force, uh, which looks like it's going to be a Space Corps, like the Marine Corps, from what we're seeing from the Pentagon, but of, of how are we going to build in redundancy in our system, and how are we going to build in resiliency into those systems that our modern way of life is now depended on. And as a conservative, uh, I am thrilled to see the private sector taking such a leading role in this, what is absolutely the 21st century space race. Uh, the moon is a big part of that. One of the things that I remind people about is the Chinese do not, do not have a NASA equivalent. They don't have a civilian kind of space ex exploration. They're not doing that to find the new, go going up into space to find the new frontier. It's 100% military. Everything they're doing up there has a military uh, component. They just put a rover on the backside of the moon. Uh, the Israelis are launching to the moon. The Indians are launching to the moon. The United States you know, needs to resume that leadership role uh, in space. And I love the fact that we're doing it partially through the private sector and not through dumping billions into a government agency. Yeah. So I, mean, I think, well, let me hit that again, if yeah, that's okay. But very quickly, because we do want to give the audience an opportunity. Okay, well, let me no, be a doctor, little bit right contrarian here. I think especially for this crowd, um, I think it's, if we're serious about everything that's been said thus far, about active defenses contributing to America's place in the world, so that everything else that we do on our deterrence and defense goals is supported, we're going to have to talk differently about missile defense. One, we need to stop talking about it as, quote, unquote, purely defensive, as opposed to something that is woven into uh, and integrate into everything it is the U.S. military does. Number one, that's that's a different thing than how we're used to this. Talking about that's that's how Reagan talked about it. We need to talk about it a little bit differently. Number two, can we steal the talking points from the Democrats in the 1990s? And if we to be a little bit countercultural here, what we need to do is to make theater missile defense great again. Because if you want to weave it, weave this in, and no kidding, integrate it, you need to talk about theater things first and low tier air defenses, things like that. That is what Russia and China will really get irritated about. And that's how we'll have a, a much greater effect than just creating a really big Fortress America bubble for the US homeland. Terrific, and a great jumping off point to your time. I wanna let you know that we do have a hard out. So we're gonna have to go through this as quickly as possible because the Congressman has a date with a young woman. His daughter, <laughs> daughter. his daughter. daughter. I wanna be very yes. clear, his daughter. So please, Take this opportunity, ask your questions clearly and loudly because we may not have mics in the audience. I will make it a point to repeat the question for our worldwide television audience. And please make it a point to punctuate your questions with a question mark. Yes, I just finished Michael Pillsbury's 100 Year Marathon. The three panels, including yourself today, corroborated, in my mind, what is truly the existential threat, not climate change. There's no doubt in my mind that we're asleep at the wheel of America. Society, in my opinion, as a layperson. 
My fundamental question is this. With all due respect to you mastering the technology and the handle on all this, because it's quite open and eye-opening, I think your challenge, and I direct this really to the congressman, is two-part. Number one is the education of the American public and your colleagues at the same time. Mm -hmm. And secondly is the funding. And look at the pushbacks that we're getting right now with regard to funding. Thank goodness for Mr. Trump and what he's accomplished. But we're talking about exposing this, if you will, to true a existential threat on a comprehensive plan that China has by 2049 to take over the world as a practical matter, and to do so by taking out our satellites and... And, and the question is? <laughs> I want to know what you're doing <laughs> Well, it's one of the reasons I ran for office. Uh, I didn't need to do this with all of this grief, but I feel as strongly and as passionately about defending this country as, as you do. So I'm here. I'm in the arena. Uh, and I think the more veterans we get in that have a wide-eyed view of what our adversaries are doing all over the world, whether it's Iran through surrogates or China is trying to do through advanced missiles, the better. So what can we all do? I think the more veterans and the more people with some dirt under their fingernails Heck, I'm going to get Rebecca to run, too, uh, that, that gets into this. Um, She'd be a great candidate. The better. But to your point, I think the broader question is how do we, as a country, deal with a metastasizing Islamic extremist threat, which is growing and not shrinking, and we can't wish those wars away as much as we'd like to, and peer adversaries that do not have our best interests in mind overlaid with $22 trillion in debt and growing. So we are talking a lot of military you know, and, and uh, stuff today, but the real stick that the United States has and its true strength is its economy, not its military. And one of the things that you know, I love about what this president is doing and that my colleagues just, my Democratic colleagues just don't get is you cannot grow wealth by dividing it. And they are seeking to take from one and give to another while this president and this administration is seeking to grow the American economy in a way that we can take on these threats that very, I 100% agree with you, are coming at us. And if you look at President Z's re-election speech, if you call that, if that's what you want to call it, he's explicit. This is the Chinese, this is a Chinese century. He's open about it. Uh, and, and they're coming, and, and you know, one of the reasons I'm on armed services is to get at what we do about it. Yes, ma'am. Do you, do you want to do it or you want me to take it? So it's a great question. So this is it's a great question too, and I'll be as brief as I can. It's a policy question, and then it's a technical question. And so on the policy question, I would just say, until this point, we've been talking about it a lot. We haven't flipped over to, to change the way we think about missile defense. We, we've still we still are essentially living under this idea that we're not going to contribute missile defense robustly against China and Russia. We need to switch over and say, you know what, the gloves are off. No longer is the United, technology has improved, the threats are getting worse, we have, we, we're not just dealing with the Soviet Union, we have multiple um, actors that we're, that we're worried about and that we still uh, want to project power and want to have a free and open global economy. And, and so we need to switch over as a matter of policy and, and get out of this mutually assured destruction or this, this idea that, that this isn't something worth investing in. And that's just members of Congress, you know, more members of Congress like this to just say, we need to get together and have a bipartisan effort to fund this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would just say is, you do have to sort of, you do have to uh, give industry 
the American industry can do it. We've done it before, we can do it. It is not a question of do we have the intellect and the technical ability to do it. We do, but you have to resource it and, and not only just resource it one year and then have a continuing resolution the next year, you have to have a constant stream and predictable budget so that we can unleash the innovation and the industry that we have available to us. And so when anybody tells you that our defense um, is too expensive, just tell them no. It's still only about 4% of GDP, I think it is. And you're seeing entire Entitlement spending and all these other things, you know, um, um, non eating, non-discretionary spending, <clears throat> eating up the budget. And so we need to be smart with our money. You don't want to waste it. There's still waste in the defense budget, but not to the degree that we're seeing elsewhere. Be smart with our money. And missile defense in particular is a tiny, tiny portion of that 4% of our budget. Of Can our I just add to, to, to how did we get here? Not to sound partisan, but I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, we lost eight years in the Obama That's administration. Right. Right. I mean, you know, remember 2012 with the debate with 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 Romney on I want my 1980s uh, foreign policy back. They, they just they just kind of shrugged it off, frankly, and did very little. And now we're playing catch up. Yeah, well, I, I, I would give credit to uh, to Madeleine Albright, who the other day before Congress said uh, uh, she apologized to Senator Romney yeah. and said, you know what, you were right. Uh, and that was back, uh, you know, couple years ago, it was easy to kind of talk that way, but that kind of also gets to the point that this has to stop being a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we do that is to change the way we talk about it. And so I emphasize that, you know, just think about it as not this exotic boutique niche thing, but it's something that is just ele elemental and fundamental to protecting U.S. forces abroad. Let's not, let's not have a partisan food fight about who wants to do national missile defense more. Yes, we got to do all those things, but, and this is frankly exactly where the most recent missile defense review came down, is we're going to keep having our basic posture on deterrence with respect to Russia and China, but what we're going to put the pedal to the metal on, at least in terms of policy, is theater active defenses to protect our forces against Russia and China. That's where the emphasis needs to be. We need to make theater missile defense great again. And in that area in particular, back to the technology, where we, um, can reap some of the things that have been percolating along over the past decade, two decades, is direct energy uh, and some other kind of de uh, developments at the, at the lower tier level. It's, ha it's hard to do lasers and microwaves for longer range and bigger missiles, but at the lower tier level, that stuff is already here. And so, uh, you know, getting that out there, fielding it, and then, you, you know, at some point using it in some conflict, that's the sort of thing that will capture the imagination uh, for directed energy just as air defense patriots in Desert Storm captured the imagination and, in the and, 1991. I know Tom just tried to make us get out of the partisan here. I'm going to be a little bit, I'm going to ding the last administration just a little bit. Um, on the laser piece, you hear a lot about lasers. Oh, it's too far away. Right after, when President Obama came into office, 2009, one of the first things he did was he cut out these advanced technologies. One of them was in directed energy. We had a program, though it had some challenges in what we call CONOPS. The, the, how it was actually going to operate in theater, the airborne laser program. Okay, so he didn't, he didn't like that program and he eliminated that program, but right after he, pro he canceled out that program, it was, on, it was still gonna finish out with a, the last couple tests and it successfully, the laser on that 747 successfully shot down a boosting missile. Um, did it a couple times, just in testing, just in testing. And, and, and it's not, it wasn't ready to, you know, totally ready to go. But what that does tell us is we do have this great potential with directed energy technology. The guts of, the, of that particular program can be used if you invest in it, resource it, um, and put it on other, other platforms and you can use it. And that's something that this administration has committed to doing, at least as a matter of policy and rhetoric. And we'll see where that, where the funding comes out in the budget and how Congress can actually um, collaborate together and make sure that we actually make this thing a reality. Time for one final question. Uh, question for Dr. Ross. Um, same as Jay. Sure. Uh, Yeah, so you, you should feel good about the fact that there are, um, so both substantively and, and, and politically, substantively, uh, there were a number of more moderate Democrats 
who have a lot of service. Some were ship drivers, some were pilots, some were, I mean, we, we did have a record number of veterans running in this class on both sides of the aisle. And you know, we're not, we are going to always be a two-party system. So for my perspective, the more veterans that I'm dealing with on the other side, the better, because we have that commonality of service, we tend to be much more mission focused and much less part, and you have some perspective, right? You've been around the world, you understand the greatness of this nation, you put your life on the line for it, you have some perspective, and most of them are on uh, the Armed Services Committee. It tends to by far be the most bipartisan, and it is the only one that is actually probably going to actually move a bill uh, this year. So. Rest easy, yeah, in, in that regard. There are definitely people that I can work with there. We're up against our heart out, but I want yes, to sir. do this, just very, very quickly to give each of the three of you an opportunity to very quickly give some closing thoughts. We'll start with the good doctor down on the end, we'll go to Ms. Heinrichs, and we'll leave the last for you, Congressman, so that you. you control when you go get to see your daughter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'll just be my fault. <laughs> <laughs> kind of uh, recapitulate a little bit what we've said, and that is that, that the, both the conversation and the politics and the technology on on this issue of, of missile defense has changed so dramatically. It's changed dramatically in 35 years, since 1983, but it's also changed dramatically in the past 15, six, 17 years uh, since the United States got out of the ABM Treaty. Uh, and so back in the 1990s, we were having this, this food fight. We were having this polarized discussion about whether we should do it or not do it in terms of active missile defenses for certain long-range ballistic missile threats. That's long gone. All right, that is here. We do have that for, for folks like North Korea. But now the conversation needs to change, and it needs to change in the direction of kind of tactical maturity. That this is no longer something new and exotic. This is something very real that needs to be insinuated and integrated into all the different things that the US military does so that it supports our most fundamental and basic power projection, deterrence, and defense goals. And then I would just say, you know, missile defense uh, is on the, we can, if, we're, if we really invest in it, resource it well, it's on the front end of deterrence. What we wanna do is prevent these wars from breaking out to begin with. So missile defense has a significant role to play in that. That's not something that should be partisan. So I mean, if this is something, if you have a chance to talk to your elected officials, when you watch the presidential debates this time, listen to what people say about this. If you can, get these questions out there. What are you doing on missile defense? Because it, it strengthens our hand diplomatically, if we have the ability, like Tom said, we can. If we have a more robust missile defense system, then then you can take. Uh, you don't have to take as much risk, and you can give diplomacy a chance with some of these other countries. Um, it deters the conflict. Um, hopefully, is what we're trying to do. If we have a more more um, robust defense, and then should deterrence break down and diplomacy fail, it'll give the United States the ability to protect that which it values most and end the conflict as quickly as possible on terms uh, most um, uh, um, to our to our best advantage by 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 giving us some more options and flexibility in protecting our assets. Congressman. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'll just, I don't think uh, anything new necessarily, except just to reemphasize, these threats are going to continue to grow. Uh, the Russians are seeking to revive the old Soviet Union. The Chinese are seeking uh, to supplant the United States as a global leader uh, in this century. And rogue states are seeking to have a spot on the stage for a variety of reasons. They're all doing it through missile technology. So this is something that I'm focused on, something that the committee uh, is very focused on. I will do my best to keep it out of uh, partisan hands. This is a national security issue and it's, a, and, and it's a critical one. My job is twofold. One, to help the Pentagon and encourage the Pentagon and put a finger in the chest of the Pentagon uh, when they need it to remove those bureaucratic obstacles uh, that our planners and our innovators and our industry need uh, to, to have removed to be able to truly match this threat. This is a, this is a threat to our way of life and to our freedoms. Uh, and I think it is going to take, to your point, sir, a lot of explanation, a lot of education, uh, not only to my colleagues, but to the American people and, and particularly to us as conservatives, and that's why I'm here today. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, so please join me in thanking three brilliant experts who gave us so much about such a vital subject today, Dr. Tom Carrico, Ms. Rebecca Heinrichs, and Congressman Mike Waltz. Thank you so much. All right.